Good morning. Good morning. I actually have a, a number of Ask the Pastor questions. Um, I'm only going to deal with one today. Um, the question is, what happened to Cain's descendants and where are they today? Answer. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know with any certainty. However, it is likely that most, if not all, died in the flood. However, the Bible doesn't tell us who were the spouses of Noah's three sons. We know somewhere in that mix, the, the Anakin, their lineage was passed down from before the flood to after the flood. Because we know when the Israelites came into Canaan, there were the Nephilim who were descendants of the Anakin, the giants in the land. Okay, so we, we know that that was passed through, evidently through someone in Noah's in-laws. So it, it's possible that one of the in-laws carried Cain's blood. If that happened, we don't know which in-law it was, so we really don't know where they are. So the answer to the first part is, I think they most likely died off. It's possible they may have, through in-laws, come through the flood. If they did come through the flood, then the answer to the second question would be here, there, and everywhere. Because we don't know where all they went. If the answer to the first question is they died off in the flood, nowhere. They're in the ground. So, um, what happened to the descendants? Scripture doesn't really tell us. Doesn't give us a good, good clue. So, um, I will leave this. Time out. Everybody get a chance to see our triclinium? Okay, if you have ever been to the Seder, we talk about how the Last Supper, the Passover Supper, when Jesus gave what we just celebrated as, as uh, the Lord's Supper, when they were celebrating that, the, the institution of that was done at the Passover dinner, at the Seder. And the table that they would have used is a triclinium. It's a three-sided table open on the other side so that the servant could come in and replenish whatever needed to be done. Okay? Uh, I would ask you to come and look at this afterwards. We believe Scripture gives us indication where some of the disciples sat. Jesus would have sat at the master's seat, which was right here. Not all the way to the head of the table, but second in. The one sitting at the right would have been the guest of honor, which we believe was John. Because remember, they would recline on their left side. Remember, lean to the left. And Scripture tells us that John leaned up against Jesus. So that would have put him to Jesus' right. To his left would have been most likely Judas. Because remember, Jesus said, He who dips with me. So they would have been in a, a close proximity to dip at the same time in the same uh, bowl. And most likely, Peter sat at the last seat, also called the servant seat. If the house was not rich enough to have servants, then the person that got the last seat would stand in as the servant. And, and remember when Jesus came to, to Peter, he wanted to, oh, don't, I'm not worthy that you would wash my feet. Jesus says, unless you let me wash my feet, you have no part of me. He says, well, wash all of me then. Okay, well, I mean, I like Peter because he's all in or he's all out. <laughs> there, there's no doubting in Peter. Yes or no. So, I would uh, invite you to come up and look at this. Uh, when we were in Israel, Dennis, Jeannie, Christy, and I uh, saw this at the Three Arches gift shop in Bethlehem. It is made out of olive wood. I don't know what this wood is here, but the, the top and all the fig dreams are made out of olive wood. So, I would invite you to come and take a look at that. So, the question, I'm going to tuck right under here, so you can come and get it afterwards. 
All right. If you have your Bible, good for you. If you don't, shame on you. Open to John chapter 15. The Gospel of John chapter 15. While you're turning there, just to back up a little bit and kind of find out where we are today. We've been talking about disciples and discipleship. We started off the week or the series by talking about how Jesus was unique among rabbis because the custom at the time was for parents when their children came of age, if they felt like their, their child was called to be a teacher, they would go and they would seek out a rabbi. And they would petition the rabbi to have their child learn underneath the rabbi. Um, we talked about how uh, we know that Paul, when he was known as Saul, studied under Gamaliel. Okay? And so the, the custom was, if you felt like your child had excelled and, and they were going to be into um, a scribe or, or a teacher of the law or a rabbi, uh, you would go and find a, a rabbi that would be able to teach them. And you wanted to get the best rabbi you could. Okay, it was, it was kind of a pride thing. Well, Jesus completely turned that upside down on its head, and he went out and called disciples to him. Okay, this is, this is unique in the custom because um, people weren't bringing their children to him, although later they brought lots of children to him, didn't they? Um, but he went out and he sought men to come and follow him. And, and remember he told... Uh, Peter and Andrew and, and probably James and John, come, I will make you fishers of men. Why? Because they were fishermen. They, they lived up in the area of Capernaum, and that was a fishing town. And so he's watching them at their trade, and, and he gives them a commission that is so much greater than their trade craft. He says, come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Okay? So we looked last week, we looked at the Great Commission, and talked about how Jesus, um, in one of the last things that he told the disciples, he laid out for them uh, the task that he wanted them to fulfill. And, and we kind of worked our way through the breakdown of that verse and how Jesus had the authority to tell them to do what he is asking them to do. Uh, he commissioned them to go out, and, and, and I told you that word doesn't mean like get up and go. It means as you're going, as you're doing life, do this, okay? And then we talked about, um, you know, you're going to go and make disciples, not converts, okay? In order to be a disciple, you, you will probably at some point become a convert, okay? But when, when did the 12 disciples become converts? We don't really know. I mean, you, you look at poor Peter. How many different times did it look like he got it only in the next chapter to look like he blew it? You know, so what, what point was Peter saved? Was it when he was called? Was it when he acknowledged Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God? Was it when Jesus breathed on them that they would receive the Holy Spirit? Was it after Jesus' resurrection when he declared that he loved the Lord three times? We, we don't know. We, we really don't know. But the point is, Jesus is saying to go and make disciples, not converts. Okay? And you go, well, I thought the conversion was the whole point. It is. But saying a simple prayer does not guarantee that you are saved. Okay? Because Scripture says that we have to believe and confess. Okay? Those two things are required unto salvation. Now, we, we know from our formula. What's our formula for salvation? Okay? Let's break it down. What's first? Grace plus Faith equals salvation. salvation. Ephesians chapter 2. Get this formula deep in your minds. Okay? Grace plus faith equals salvation. 
You notice what's missing from that equation right there? Works. works. Okay? But works is actually part of the equation, only it comes after. So it's grace plus faith equals salvation unto works. Okay, so works is not part of the salvation equation. It's a derivative. It's something that comes out of. <coughs> Alright? So, in this process, we need to understand that there are a lot of Christians or, or people going around calling themselves Christians today that have no clue. <coughs> Scripture tells us that many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, they think they're okay. And yet, he's going to say, I never knew you. Uh, actually, a, a couple of the questions that are in the queue are, are dealing with that issue directly. So I'm going to speak in greater detail on that next week and ask the pastor question. Uh, because there are a lot of Christians in America, and I use Christians in quotes, that will not be in heaven. Because they are not, in fact, saved. Okay? So, we'll, we'll deal with that a little bit more next week. Uh, but then we looked at the call... And we started into the three positions of the call. Last week we looked at the demand. When Jesus calls us, it is not a request. It's a demand. Now you can refuse the demand. God's heart is that all men would be saved. Everyone. That's His heart. When Jesus went to the cross, He didn't die for select sins. He died for all sin. All of it. The difference between those that are saved and those that are not is that those that are saved are inheritors of the blood of Christ. That's, that's what marks us as different from the rest. Okay? When Jesus calls us, He calls us to come and die. And we looked in a couple of different passages um, that you are called to deny yourself and to take up your cross and follow Him. Well, what do dead people get to keep? Nothing. Because eventually it all rots away. Okay, You think about all the treasures that Pharaoh Tutankhamun was buried with. Riches and wealth and fabulous things. His sarcophagus, sarcophagus was plated in gold. And yet, how much of that does he have today? Nada. Zip. Zilch. He has the big tohu wabohu. None. Okay? So, you can't take it with you. But the same thing holds true as a believer. When you come, you come via the cross. And you give up all the stuff that you think is yours in exchange for all the stuff that He says is yours. And when you come to the cross, you can't come negotiating. We look through a number of times that disciples or followers of Jesus came to Him and they, they said, well, let me do this first. And what did he tell them? Well, let the others deal with that. Come follow me. Come follow me. The rich young ruler. You know, if that rich young ruler had walked into the majority of the churches today, he'd probably be on the board. Mm -hmm. Very few churches would have put the condition on him that Jesus did. Because you don't want to lose a good tither. So when he comes and he says, Master, what must I do to be saved? Jesus tells him, Obey the law and the prophets. Well, I've done all these things since I was a child. And yet Jesus looks into him and he sees his heart. And he sees the sin condition of this man. And where does he meet him? Right at that sin condition. And he tells him, One thing you lack. One thing. Go sell all your possessions. Give them to the poor. 
and then come follow me. Now, the rich young ruler went away sad because he had great wealth. Where was his heart? His wealth. He was willing to do all that the law and the prophets commanded, but he didn't want to give up his wealth. Why was that so important? Because Scripture tells us you cannot serve both God and mammon. You can't serve two masters. And he knew, Jesus knew, that that rich young ruler, his heart was wrapped up around that wealth, that money, those possessions. We look at the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus fed him. He ministered to him. And then the next, that night, early the next morning, he goes to the other side of the lake, takes a boat and sails across to the other side of the lake. They all get up and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa where'd he go? And so the whole community follows him to the other side of the lake. And they come and they say, hey, hey, hey. What does Jesus do? He tells them, the only reason you're coming after me is because you want food. You want what I can give you. You want the, the, the meal. You want breakfast. And then he goes on and he tells them, look, I tell you the truth, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, and they go, whoa, time out. <laughs> Man, I'm just looking for fish and bread. I ain't looking for cannibalism. <laughs> and what happened? They fell away. Because, see, they were more interested in the titillation of his miracles than they were in his lordship. And so many of us today are titillated by his miracles. We desperately want him as Savior because I, I don't know anyone in their sane mind understanding fully what Scripture says hell is going to be like that wants to go there. You hear people say all the time, Oh, yeah, I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to party with my friends. Uh -huh. No, you're not. There's not going to be any partying going on in hell. You want to party, you got to go to heaven. Oh, amen. Okay? Because that's the first thing we're going to do. God's going to throw us a party. It's a, a, a celebration, a feast. A wedding feast. Okay? So that's where the party's happening. Because see, if you're not at the party, you're on the outside in the darkness. You're in the lake of fire. And you don't feel much like partying. When Jesus told the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, <clears throat> did you see the rich man partying? No, as a matter of fact, the only thing he wanted was for someone to dip their hand in some water and come and touch it to his tongue that he might receive some relief. So there's not going to be any partying in hell. Alright? So, discipleship. <clears throat> so we see the demand. One of the, the conditions uh, of this discipleship, of this conversion process, is everything becomes twisted, turns upside down. And God... Everything actually works the way it's designed to work, but because of sin, everything's warped. And we grew up with everything warped. Okay? And when you come to the cross, you got to look through the knothole of the cross to be able to see things the way they're supposed to be. Okay? You got to put your eyeball up there and allow God to put things back the way that He intended. Because Jesus says, hey, if you want to live, what do you have to do? Die. Die. Whoa. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. He says if you want to be great, you have to become the least. You want to lead, you got to serve. Everything is backwards in this dynamic to the way we understand things to operate. But God's way is so much better than ours. Matter of fact, we are cautioned over and over and over. We're directed, we're commanded to be humble. It's when we're humble that God lifts us up. Okay, we, we come in with arrogance and pride. 
What does he do? Guess what? <laughs> He's going to humble you. <laughs> okay, Because your, your pride, your arrogance is nothing before him. You look at the men throughout Scripture that came into the presence of God. And what did they do almost without failure? <laughs> Woe is me! They're down on their faces. Because they understand. They in that instant see the vast difference between the holy, almighty, righteous God and themselves. And they can't do anything but get on their face and cower because they know it is within His right to destroy them. Thank God for the blood of the cross. Amen? Amen. 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 Because of that blood, we can stand before Him and be accounted as righteous. So, the first of the three components is demand. The second one, I'm going to try and cover two of these today, two of the three. The second is grace. Now, when Jesus calls us to a demand, with this demand that we give up everything, that we go and do as He calls us to do, which of us can do that in our own strength? <laughs> no one. Not one of us. We, we can do in some measure, but we will never be able to do fully. We'll never be able to do fully. So with the demand comes grace. When, when He calls us, He doesn't call us to do something and then just leave us to do it. John chapter 15. We're going to read a few verses here. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm going to read that verse again. <clears throat> abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Got to catch that, folks. Apart from him, you can do nothing. You can take all of your great works and present them to God and they will account as nothing if you do them outside of Him. Outside of Christ. Okay? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. You guys catching a repeating of words here? Abide. What does to abide mean? Yeah, to remain, to stay. To live in. To not depart from. Okay? And, and if you want to thrive, you have to abide. Well, that almost rhymed. <laughs> if you want to thrive in your walk with Christ, you have to abide in Him.
So verse 9 again, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Can you grasp that? How much God loves you? How much Jesus loves you? I mean, we, we always put it up against some measure of something that we can, can understand. But that's always so much, so, so shallow compared to the true depth of His love. As the Father has loved the Son, so the Son loves us. Wow. If that doesn't overwhelm you, then I would ask that you would get on your face before God and not move until He reveals it to you. In the prophets it says, you will find me if you seek me with what? Heart. Your whole heart. Mm -hmm. Your whole heart. After Christy and I were married, I went, uh, she was taking some courses for the summer school and, and I went back to Denver and every day she wrote me a letter. Every day. This, I know for you young people, before internet, <laughs> before cell phones, before email, before texting. It was like longhand on paper. <laughs> and you had to put it in the mail and I didn't get it for several days. <sighs> there was no instantaneous gratification. As a matter of fact, she got to Denver before a couple of her letters got to me. Okay? Because that's what you do when you love each other. You want that communion. You want that relationship. You want that intimacy. So, abide in my love. And then verse 10. See, there's, there's a, a dilemma that we have in the church. Because we want to bring people to the cross, but we forget what's on the other side of the cross. Because our formula, say it with me, grace plus faith equals salvation unto works. But there are two conditions throughout the New Testament that reveal, that are gauges whereby you can measure, are you saved? The first one is this next verse. Number, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. See, the first of those two conditions is that when you come to salvation, you want to obey. That Holy Spirit living in you is going to prompt you to live a life of righteousness. And when you get off course, He's going to give you a little stinger. He's going to bring conviction. He's going to tell you, no, no, no. This is not of God. This removes, this damages, this hinders that relationship with God. This has got to go, baby. It's got to get out of here. And when you have salvation, that Spirit is going to birth in you a hunger to be righteous. And, and you will contest because, hey man, your flesh does not go down easy, does it? Uh-uh. That flesh is like an obstinate two-year-old. I want it. I want it my way. And I want it now. Oh, come on, don't tell me I'm the only one with two-year-old flesh. <laughs> All right? It's a battle. It's a war. Okay? But that spirit is going to prompt you and start prompting you. And sometimes it's going to annoy you. You've got, you got to stop that. I don't want to stop this. This isn't so bad. I haven't killed anyone. And we, 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 you know, we like to prioritize sins. And of course, our sins are usually the ones that are not quite so bad. You know, at least I'm not like that guy. Or that gal. You know. Okay. 
Well, they're not the measure, are they? Who's the measure? Jesus. Because, see, that's, that's what he says here. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments. Looking through the Gospels, did you see that any time that Jesus thought his Father's commandments were burdensome? No. He wasn't burdened. That's where he found life. That's what, you know, he would separate himself out from the people and even from, from the apostles and the disciples and he'd go off by himself and he might commune with the Father and receive refreshing. That's the same thing that works for us if we abide in him. Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. See, it's not just about following the law because, you know, following the law saves nobody. Get that? Following the law saves nobody. There is one way unto salvation. That is the shed blood of Jesus Christ taking your place on the cross. That's it. God's grace. You can do nothing to earn it. You can do nothing to maintain it. Do you understand that? That's how great His grace is. But look what he says comes out of this. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Do you ever think about Jesus as being joyful? I, see, I grew up with... Um, okay, Christy. The, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. And, and the presentation of Jesus was this mysterious holy man that I could never relate to. I look at that and I go, huh, why are you following him? Man, everything is a downer with that guy. You know? He, uh, there, there's, there's, you don't see relationship with that presentation of Jesus. I'm much more like the Jesus in Matthew. I like the Jesus that I can picture upending a jug of water on Peter's head. I like the Jesus that laughs. That joy just poured out of. I'm not a typically joyful person. My doctor, I tell you, he asks the same question every time I go in, and I have never yet got a good answer for him. He says, So, what are you doing for fun? I know that question's coming. Every time I hear it, my mind goes blank. What are you doing for fun? <laughs> fun. I know the word. I'll turn and I'll look at my wife and she's like, huh? Don't look at me. I've been with you for 30 years and I don't know what you have for fun. <laughs> I know it's a sad place. <laughs> me and David are going to get together afterwards. He's just showing me how to have fun. All right? But when I see Jesus that laughs, that even as he's giving directives, he's doing so out of a, a compassion and a love for those that he is directing. He's not like this Hitler that stands up on the podium and screams and shouts, and you better do what he says or he's going to kill you. He's not up on the podium. He's down in the midst of the people. Even getting offended when they won't let the children come to him. He says, no. Bring them to me. As a matter of fact, I love the way Mark says it, because Mark says he picked one of them up, held him in his hands. I love that picture of Jesus. Because Isaiah, I believe it's chapter 40, verse 11, says that we're like lambs and God picks us up and He holds us close to His heart. I love that picture of God. The, the one where He's so holy and distant, the whole point of the cross was that we might be brought near to Him. Okay? So continuing on. Verse 12. So verse 11, that your joy may be full. Verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. 
You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Now think about that for a minute, guys. James tells us that friendship with the world is enmity toward God. When, when you're friends with the world, you're an enemy of God. Okay? In Romans, it says that, you know, people won't lay down their lives. Uh, maybe someone might do it for a righteous man. But that in our sin, we were enemies of God. And yet, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. And I think that's so beautifully summed up right here. Okay? That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus proved his love for us at the cross. Because he wasn't going there for his own sake, was he? He wasn't going there to be punished for something he did, was he? Why was he going? He was going for us. He was going in our place. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, now you, you can look at that in one of two ways. You can look at that through the eyes of religion. And you can read into that condemnation. Oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to do all that he has commanded me. Or you can turn that around and look at that through the eyes of relationship. Because see, Jesus also told us that it was better for us that he depart. Now, I, I still have trouble wrapping my mind around this. It's better for me that Jesus depart. I'd love to sit out and, and hang out with Jesus. Okay? That, that's probably the highlight of anything that I do is when I am in prayer and I'm in my quiet room and I can just feel him sitting beside me. Okay? That's, that's, that's like, that's it for me. I love that. And yet, he says it's better that I go so that this Holy Spirit can come. Okay? We have got the Holy Spirit that is a seal on our lives that proves our salvation. Okay? He has not left us friendless. Okay? Get, you understand that? Friendless. He has sent a friend. And then he says, No longer do I call you servants, for, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. I have called you friends. And what does he base this friendship on? Because I've told you everything that my Father has told me. I've not kept it secret. I've not hidden anything from you. Here it is. I'm giving it to you. Here's all the secrets. And he calls us friend. So the grace. The grace. I was really hoping we could get to the third point today, the promise. But we're going to wrap up with the grace. See, when Jesus calls, it's a demand. It's a demand. It's a requirement. Because when you come, you've you got to come all the way. Nobody gets to bring anything in. Okay, Everything that, that you're going to have is going to be stuff that he gives you. Okay? So when, when you come in, you come via the cross. You lay everything down. But then he gives you grace. He pours grace into you. Just as the Father was with Jesus and poured grace into Him, Jesus has promised the same unto us that He's going to pour into us. He's never going to leave us. As a matter of fact, at the, the end of the Great Commission, He tells us that He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. So even in those times when, when He just feels awfully distant, He is right there with you. That's His promise. Okay? And the Word of God is never a lie. Amen? Okay, so the, the, the call to discipleship, the demand, the grace, and then next week we're going to look at the promise. Okay? And then we're going to, we're going to go a little bit into the actual process of discipleship after that. Father, we thank you today. God, we can't even grasp we cannot comprehend how rich your grace is.
how rich your mercy is. We, we can't wrap our minds around this love that you have for us. That you would send your own son in our place. That he would take our sins. That we might be able to stand before you. That we might be the very friends of God. We ask today that you would mold us, shape us. That we would become more like you. That our lives would grow daily more and more to reflect you. That your light, your life in us would shine out to the people around us. Give us boldness to speak truly. Direct our paths, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.